They all thought we were just going through a phase until like, I think when I was 15, I showed up at the house with a swastika tattooed on my neck. And I think they were like, well, maybe it's a little bit more. My name is Frank Mink. I uh, grew up in Philadelphia, in South Philadelphia. Didn't grow up Jewish. Actually was uh, raised Catholic. A lot of our family, I guess, just integrated and went with it. Came up on a pretty rough life, single mom, uh, dad in another neighborhood. And so, um, you know, kind of grew up poor uh, on welfare and stuff as a kid, not really knowing any identity in life, so. So tell us a little bit about growing up in South Philadelphia and uh, growing up Catholic. To live in South Philly and especially in my neighborhood, you didn't have to go to church, but you had to make all your sacraments. Like that was part of being part of our gang, in the neighborhood gang. Like, everyone made their sacraments. So uh, my family was kind of, my grandmother was definitely involved in the church. Um, I was uh, uh, the good Catholic boy that went on Christmas and Easter, and it was probably my times of going, like their high holidays. Stuff revolved around the, the Catholic Church there, so. So can you tell us how old you are and what was the sort of process of getting more involved in the skinhead culture? Okay. So, uh, yeah, when I was about 13, again, it was a rough upbringing. Um, I had just got shipped from my mom's Catholic Irish Catholic neighborhood up to my dad's neighborhood. And I went to this all black school um, where I fist fought a lot. I mean, it was just, there was a lot of trouble there at that school. Uh, there was about 20 white kids, not 20%, just 20 of us. Coming from my mom's neighborhood were racist. You were always taught like the others were bad. The, the Italians were bad, even though I was part Italian too. But the Italians are bad, the Cambodians are bad, the blacks are bad. And now they're taught the same thing about us, that the Irish are bad. So it's just this ongoing thing. but. When I got shipped up to the different neighborhood, I really started to notice what, that my race had something to do with why I'm getting in fistfights all the time and getting jumped. That summer, I got to get away from my dad's house. Now, I, got, I just want to remind people that it was like, you know, we were on like food stamps, like welfare, where when you're like in the corner deli and, and you pull out food stamps, like everybody knows your business. I, I was a little ashamed of our, my life and uh, not ashamed, but just embarrassed of our living situation. And so now the situation gets worse being up at the black school. Well, that summer, I got to get out of the city. My uncle had moved up to the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area. And so I go up to go hang out with my cousin who was in that area. And he was involved in the stuff. He, he, the summer before, he was a punk rocker. So, and I kind of was a punk rock kid. So I, I thought when I go up there, he's going to be more punk rock stuff. And so when I first seen him and, and seen his friends, they all looked different and they were all shaved bald, and they were 16, 17 year olds. I'm, How old were you? I was 13, going on 14 that summer. And these guys were just cool to me. They, they, had dro they, had dro they drove cars, they had tattoos, uh, but they said things that was different, where they would say things like, multiracial society doesn't work. I'm a 14 year old, no idea what that means. But when they start talking about blacks and whites get, not getting along, I'm like, for one, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They don't live around black people. They live around other white people, Amish people. So when they start talking about this stuff, my cousin would say to them, yo, like, my little cousin here lives in one of the roughest neighborhoods in Philly, and I did. So now these guys wanted to talk to me, like, what's it really like to be around black people? And I'm sure they didn't use the word black. What's it really like? And them guys asking me, what's it like growing up that way? See, my parents never asked me, when I came home from school with a black eye or whatever, or come home with a trophy, whatever, my parents, either my mom or my dad, never said, how's life? How's school? How'd you get that black eye? I, they didn't have time for me. These guys asking me, what's it like being around black people? Was someone asking me, how's my life? And I, 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 loved, I, I loved it. I became this little, the little guy that hung around with the, the crazy stories. And, and these guys would always talk to me. And, Man, I just thoroughly enjoyed being around them. Also, when they would go out, all these other neo-Nazis would meet up at these clubs and I would go with them. And I still had hair at the time. I still had this little skateboard or haircut, you know, and I wasn't shaved yet. And I seen how everyone feared them. Everywhere we went, every nightclub we went to, everyone feared them. And I know I didn't look like them, but I felt part of them and I felt people feared me. And I gotta be honest, I might be a 14-year-old kid at the time, but really I'm probably like a seven or eight-year-old kid with the, the development that I've had, uh, with the abuse. Um, and I'm just a scared little boy. 
I was scared of my parents. I was scared of my step-parents. I was scared of my school. I was scared if I was going to have enough food to eat some days. Now people fear me because I'm with them. Loved it. Yeah. Loved it. But there was other things, you know, like, I'll give you an example. Like, I, you would always hear, like, little racist ethnic jokes in our neighborhood. Yeah. That was just the way it was. And so I remember, like, people would say, my uncle would come back and say, oh, John, I went to the store today, and Johnny didn't give me the right change back, the, the cashier. You know, Johnny, he's always trying to Jew us. Right? And everyone laughed. <laughs> and so, or how do you start a Jewish parade? You roll a penny down the street and everyone laughed. And I remember as a kid, I didn't get the joke. Did you grow up around Jews no, at all? No, so no, no. in your mind, the word Jew, what did it mean? At the time, it just meant this other group of people, just another ethnic group that I guess I'm supposed to hate, really. Like, that's just kind of the way. And so I asked my uncle one time when everyone was laughing at one of his jokes, I said, one of his Jewish jokes, I said, why is that funny? Like, because I want to know, why is everyone laughing? Like, it's kind of like, why is everyone laughing? Whenever you say Johnny tried to Jew me, why is that funny? And he starts to break it down. He goes, well, see, Frank, the Jews are kind of notorious for money. And then he stopped himself and said, you know, you'll get the joke when you're older. I was much younger at the time. He's like, you'll get the joke when you're older. It's a funny joke. When I'm at my first neo-Nazi Bible studies, because they taught how to hate through the Bible. I'm in Reading, Pennsylvania, and I'm in this little compound, and this guy comes up and he starts talking about the Bible and this, and, and he starts to talk about how the Jews, at the time they called it the Zionist Occupational Government. It's the secret government that runs the world, okay? Um, he says that the Jews secretly take the money from the Federal Reserve. They siphon money from the Federal Reserve, and they give it to Israel so that they could start the next world war. For one, I'm 14 years old at the time, and you're talking about the Federal Reserve. I'm 48, still don't know what the Federal Reserve does, just trouble, right? So I'm like, all right, whatever. But what happened to me in that moment was, I got the joke. I got my uncle's joke. I must be older. I get it, like, oh, okay. And then they would go on to preach through the Bible on how to hate, especially Jews. Um, and it's some of the most wildest stories. I felt like I was unlocking something. That again, I, I want to know what the adults know. They left me to fend for myself. So the, and I'm starting to get this insider knowledge. I was in. So that was kind of the, the way of the, it, the culture growing on me. That, oh, okay, I must be an adult now, and I'm with these men, and uh, I feel good being with them. And people fear me, right? Again, I was running home from school two months earlier. Now people are running from us. So how long did it take for you to fully feel like integrated into that culture? Just a couple months. And then that was your identity? That was it. And, and, and for whatever reason, Hashem has given me gifts. When, like, they could be used good or bad, you know? I was always a person that was able to get people into things. Like when I was a kid, I was always recruiting kids to play hockey or whatever. Like I was just one of those type of people. And I just gravitated to getting, well, I had to go back to my neighborhood after that summer. So now I got to go back into my dad's neighborhood, go back into my mom's neighborhood. So I got to—I—I I only had neo Nazis up in the farms. I got to get guys in the neighborhood into this, right? And it was very easy because I'm just using the neighborhood racism stuff and be like, "Oh, we're just—we're about the white race." See, this whole thing is—is is the biggest scam. It's the biggest bait and switch. You know the bait and switch. The bait and switch is I promise you something, I give you something else. When I would talk to a man or a child, a boy or whoever, and they would say, man, I just want to be proud of my, my heritage. I want to be proud of my white race. Man, me too, man. Me too. That's what we're all about. Come to our group because that's what we're about. When you come to our meetings, we don't ever talk about being proud of being white. We only talk about them. We talk about you. We talk about their ruining things. That we don't. You can only talk about Leif Erikson so much and be proud of stuff. You know what I mean? Honestly, it's... It, it, it's a bait and switch. We take these people's false pride and we turn it into hate because it's their fault. You mentioned in your story that at the core of this like skinhead culture was a lot of fear. Yes. Even though it seems like it's about power and strength and, and you know superiority, we're better. Mm -hmm. So how does, how does it come from fear? I at one time believed because of the color of my skin, I was better than and that God loved me more than others. Like, that's pretty arrogant, right? Um, but it's all wrapped around this fear, this low self-esteem, this low self-worth that, again, I'm identifying the 
I'm proud of something that I had nothing to do with. My parents just happened to have the same color. Like, I'm putting all my pride in, like, I didn't go out and achieve anything. I'm not going out and doing good for society. I'm not going out for humanity. I just have this color skin, it makes me better. Like, that's fear, because you're not accomplishing anything. So um, the whole movement, it, it, almost all, any extreme movement is all based in fear. Fear that you're gonna take what's mine, right? Fear you're gonna take my neighborhood. Fear you're gonna take the white girls. Fear, fear this, it's always fear. And then we turn it around and make it into this false pride and arrogance. And that's why there's a lot of violence, you know? Because I have to put violence on the world because you don't believe what I believe, but then I have to stand up to you and, and force you to believe what I believe. Right. It's all fear and arrogance. Did you feel like it was a way to help channel your anger? I mean, when I look back on it, yes. But back then, I didn't know I was doing that. I just thought I was standing up for the white race and, you know, look at my neighborhood. And so it was, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I can look back on now and go, absolutely that. But at the time, I, you know, I didn't know how I was channeling anything. I, you know, I had some deep-rooted issues in, in my family, in my life, and so. How did your family react to this? We are, there was a couple, I had a couple cousins that were involved. So my family, they think, they all thought we were just going through a phase. They did, they just thought we were going through a phase. Until like, I think when I was 15, I showed up at the house with a swastika tattooed on my neck. And I think they were like, well, maybe it's a little bit more. You know, they don't know that I'm like selling guns on the side at 15 years old, selling illegal guns to people. They don't know what I'm doing. I, my, I wasn't, once uh, I was 15, or 14, really, when I was 14 or 15, I didn't live home anymore. I moved in with the movement. I just went and lived with people in the compounds and all over the country, so. So that I wasn't around my family much. And what about school and church? Did that just sort of slip away? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I, 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 I never went to high school. Um, church was, you know, I mean, in my own way, I seen like the hypocrisy in church at the time, you know, so that I was not, I, I went to these Bible studies now that were, all geared towards hate, so, and that made me feel good. Again, I would go to Bible studies and be taught how to hate, and it made me go, oh, okay, God's on our side. That's why, that's why I say, like, because of my skin color, I thought God loved me better. Insane. People bring God into all sorts of things. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And they exclude them a lot from yeah. things, too. Yeah, so how long did this whole uh, you know, I'm not gonna call it a phase because clearly it wasn't just a phase, but how long did it last before it started to chip away? Um, so I started to get out when I was 19. I just got out of prison. Um, again, swastikas everywhere on my body. Um, I knew at the end, when, when I got released from prison, I knew at the end of this that I was starting to still associate with a group that I knew the beliefs were wrong, but I had a lot of clout, I had a lot of pull, and that felt good, do you know? It was like, I had nothing else in the world, but I had some respect from this group. Like, I went to prison for pretty horrendous, pretty bad crime, but in the movement, it was looked at as a beautiful, it was a, you know, I, I kidnapped some, uh, an Antifa member, you know? The, the, so, to them, you know, I, I got out of prison. I was looked at as as a, as a hero in a way, and it felt and and all that did again was build my ego, which my ego was broken. My ego was so broken. What happened in prison that sort of triggered this? Okay. You know, um, doubt in the movement or a little bit of it. By the time I was leaving prison, I had really started just to connect with a couple guys, and uh, when I got out, I would go. I went back to the movement, of course. And, and I, I didn't leave, I wasn't, even in prison, I wasn't like, I'm changing, I just was me doing me. So when I got out and I started to hang back around with some of the neo-Nazi groups again, um, and I would hear just people go, you know, all black people are this way. And I was like, man, like I, I really shared some intimate things with some of them dudes in there, just life stuff. And, and they weren't all that way, right? So I was like, okay, to stay part of this neo-Nazi group, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna preach about black people anymore or Latino people because I became friends with a bunch of Latino guys in prison too. I was just like, yeah, I'm just not gonna preach on that stuff because I just don't believe it. But what I'm gonna stick with is I'm gonna just preach against the Jews and that'll keep me in. I'll still be in the group. 
Well, at this point, had you met Jews or still really. still no interaction? There wasn't any in prison, to be honest. There's not, not not in the prisons I was in. So there was no, and so that's where that's where Hashem steps steps in because I'm looking for a job. I'm living back in Philly, and I have a big swastika on my neck right here, and I have stuff on my hands at the time, and so I'm trying to get work. I don't know about you, but. Uh, when you go fill out a job application and you already have an aggravated kidnapping as a, a felony on your lifetime record now, and you have a swastika on your neck, these ain't good people skills. You know what I mean? Like, what are you gonna do, management? Oh, he's got a swastika, management, definitely. So it's not happening. So a buddy of mine came to me and said, yo, I can, I can get you a job for a weekend making $100 a day, which at the time was beautiful. This was 1994. Get you hundred bucks a day. You just work for this one weekend, carrying in and out antique furniture at this antique show. Will you do it? And I was like, Yeah, I'll take the job definitely. He says, um, As soon as I said I'll take the job, he goes, But I got to tell you, the dude that owns a company, he's a Jew. Like, do you want the job? And he's like, And he's he's a Jew, right? <laughs> so I was so hard up for money at the time. I said, You know, I was like, I don't care. I'll I'll take the job. I said, But did you tell him about me? And he goes, Yeah, I told him all about you. So I show up, start working for this dude. I make like $600 in tips, and uh, he still owes me $300 at the end of the day, at the end of this weekend. So I'm happy, it's like I made 600 bucks in tips, but I think he knows this. I thought at the end of the weekend, he was gonna come up to me and say, hey, um, you know, how much money, you know, I, I was gonna say, you owe me money. I had the whole argument planned in my head, like I you know, thought about it, thinking about how I'm gonna come at him and go at him. And so he comes up and he goes, I owe you money, right? And I said, yeah. And I was like, you owe me $300. And I'm waiting for him to say, well, you made 600 in tips, so that's your pay. I'm waiting for this, right? And he just goes, 300, huh? I said, yep. And he pulls out a lot of money and he says, here's one, here's two, here's three. And he's like, you're a really good worker. Here's an extra 100 bucks. And all I thought, no lie, all I thought was, you son of a gun. Like, I was wanting to fight with the guy. He gives me 400 bucks, now I have $1,000. So he says, hey, I'll give you a ride back over uh, to South Philly from where we were, we were in Jersey. So I'll give you a ride back over in this truck. I said, okay, get in the truck, we're driving. And as we're driving, he just, so what do you do for a living? And now again, my, I'm in the passenger seat, so my swastika is blazing at him right here. He's driving, looking over, talking. He says, what do you do for a living? And I said, I don't do anything. And he said, well, why don't you come work for me? So I go up and I start working for this man. Now, I hadn't changed yet. I'm still holding on because again, every night, every weekend, I'm still hanging with my neo-Nazi friends, right? This is just one guy, it's just the exception. And one day I broke something and I went to Keith and I said, as I always did because I have something wrong with me. Again, I have a broken ego, that's why I'm in, in the neo-Nazis, but I secretly think I'm stupid. And so I broke something and I was like, oh, I'm so stupid, Keith, I'm so stupid, I'm so sorry. And he came over to me and he gripped me up and he said, stop saying you're stupid, you idiot. Clean it up and let's go. And I cleaned up this mess. We get in the truck. We're driving from North Jersey down in the Philly and we're talking on a turn bike. And he just says to me, um, he says, Frank, I hate when you say you're stupid. He's like, you're one of the smartest people I ever met. He's like, so you must be calling me stupid because I think you're one of the smartest people I ever met. And, and he said, Frank, and he told me these words and these words have stuck with me to this day. He said, Frank, smart people can fake being dumb, but dumb people can't fake being smart. You just are. Um, sitting in the truck with this dude who just was like, so kind to me, you know, so kind. So, uh, this always gets to me, just because this was the moment when he pulls up to drop me off. I'm waiting for him to keep my pay because I broke furniture, you're not allowed to break furniture, that was his rule. And I broke his furniture, so he was allowed to be like, hey, because he paid me in cash every week, he was gonna take some money out, and be like, this is for that marble top table you broke, you idiot. And he didn't, he just handed me the whole envelope. He goes, here, I'll see you on Monday. So, uh, get out of the truck, and I remember I'm just walking home. And as I'm walking home, there was just this overwhelming sense of like, dude, you're so wrong. Like, you're so wrong in what you're doing right now. Like, we're always making exceptions for our hate, and I just got tired of it. So that was the day, like I went home, and I was like, yo, I'm, I'm just done. Like, I literally felt like I was banging my head against the wall to believe this stuff at the end. So, 
that is like the final day when I was finally like, I'm, I'm just done with this. And uh, people say, well, like, what do you do? Like, you have to uh, go get beat up out or this or that. No, I just stopped going around. I found other friends and I stopped identifying with that. How old were you at this point? 19, 19 going on 20. And then um, right after that all happened, right after I changed, probably six months later, the Oklahoma City bombing happened. And, uh, you know, for people that don't know, that is tied back to the movement. It is tied back to the same people that I used to run with. And I didn't know Timothy McVeigh. I, but there was this picture of this dead little girl in this fireman's arms when he's running down the street with her. It just kept killing me. Like that picture just kept killing me, killing me. So I went to the FBI. And I was like, yo, here's who I am. And uh, they knew exactly who I was. So they actually hooked me up with the Anti-Defamation League first and said, would you go talk to this group? And I went and talked to the Anti-Defamation League. And then they asked me to go speak to some kids and some stuff like that. And what happened was I felt like I was changing my karma score. Like I felt there's a karma score in the world. And we gave a credit score. We had a karma score. And my karma score was really, really bad. And I just felt like I was filling up my, my karma score a little bit. And then I came up with a hockey program called Harmony Through Hockey, where we started getting black kids in the city of Philly to play by far the greatest game on earth, hockey. That's no arguments right there. So, um, uh, and I did that for years. And because uh, I didn't want to be a guy going around going, hey, look, I used to do bad stuff. Now I don't do it anymore. Like I wanted to do good. So that was the whole big change. And then I became an activist. I started doing interventions on neo-Nazis and getting them out. And I um, was one of the first people in the nation doing that. And like at the time, I, you know, I didn't depend on God the way I do today. But I, when I look back on it now, it was him just teaching me. So when did you find out you were Jewish? So that's an interesting story. Um, so I was doing a lot of anti-hate um, work. And one of the things, my autobiography had come out, and so uh, a group had asked me to do a documentary with them. And they wanted to do a documentary on religion, the re religious diversity of Iowa. I don't know if you've been to Iowa, the state of Iowa. It's in the middle of the country, and it doesn't look very diverse, I'll tell you that. I became friends with one of the Chabad rabbis in the morning, just through my anti-hate work. We knew each other. I ate at his restaurant sometimes. And so I asked him to please be part of the documentary. And so we came, we showed up one day with all the camera crew, we're walking in with the lights. And he says, so are you finally gonna do, are you finally gonna tell the world you're Jewish? And I was like, I'm not Jewish. He goes, you should look up your last name. And he's like, it's Ashkenazi. He's like, you just gotta look it up. And so we're joking and he's like, and, and he, cause he had joked with me before and I had actually heard this joke before that I looked Jewish. So it was funny. And so he's like, I told you you look Jewish. So I put out something on social media and one of my uncles wrote back and says, yeah. And now that I remember at the time when I was younger becoming a neo-Nazi, my uncle did come to me one time but he, and said, you know, we have a little bit of Jewish in us, right? I didn't believe him because he's one of them uncles that just bust your chops all the time. So I thought he was just trying to do anything to get me to not be a neo-Nazi. So I didn't believe him, never thought about it again. Well, he wrote me on, on Facebook and was like, I told you, I told you this years ago. And a couple of ants jumped in and said, yeah, like, some all on my mom's side, like my mom's 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 mom, and then I guess the, the last name Mink, which actually comes from my grandfather, is this uh, Ashkenazi name, and we started looking into it, and then started talking with uh, a couple of rabbi friends of mine, and uh, just started to believe. Then I started going to study, and I started reading Torah, and I started rapping to filming, and it just all just started happening. And and I'm also in recovery, uh, and I'm very active in my recovery, which is. Uh, 12 steps, and, I'm, and I'd struggle with that for a long time. And when I started putting this together, the best way I can describe it is, it was like, like Hashem is like the zipper, but the teeth coming together was like my recovery in Judaism perfectly coming together, along with my activism, because my activism is one of the main things of my life. And it just all started to come together. This is where I'm, uh, uh, making a full-on conversion over to Judaism. So I'm living on a boat, and the only thing I got to do, because I was living on a boat, hiding, was uh, watch videos of like Rabbi Friedman, Rabbi YY, all these guys who just, like, that was my main way of learning. When I just moved to a new area, it is hard for me 
uh, just to walk into a synagogue with tattoos. I just, I always felt weird, you know what I mean? So I had to do everything online. It was during COVID. So I did everything online. I remember I got to talk to one of the rabbis in person. And I said, uh, it was one of the Chabad rabbis brought me to a school to come talk. And I said, well, don't you know, man, like, like I wasn't raised Jewish. Because I, you know, I feel that, I'm like, I feel that. So I'm like, I'm not, I wasn't raised Jewish. I have a bar mitzvah. Now. And he goes, Frank, if you ever feel judged, or if anyone ever judges you for that, tell them to go judge Moses, because he wasn't raised Jewish neither. How about that? It's just little things like that. And maybe be like, okay, I get to do this. And it's just a daily thing. It's my daily life. So when you were watching all these videos, mm -hmm. what sort of messages were, were they saying that resonated with you? I'll tell you one of the things that really resonated with me was when I was in the neo-Nazi movement, see, I was once bitten by this, the venom of anti-Semitism. So now I've built up the anti-venom in me. I was always told in, in, in any circle you go around in those groups, you're gonna hear that there's basically like 10 old Jewish men who run the world, okay? Um, and as you know, and as everyone here knows, um, I've come to know that when you get 10 old Jewish men together, that's 30 different opinions. They don't even know we're gonna eat lunch. We don't know how to run the world. And people say, well, the Jews are the head of this, and the Jews are high up in this company, and the Jews are high up in this field, and it's, you know, they use banking. And then I think, but we're also, as I was learning through Proverbs, it says, you know, about educating yourself and learning and knowledge and wisdom, I started to realize that if you look in the addiction fields, there's Jewish people that are heads of that. There's Jewish people that are heads of marketing. There's, it, like when you look at all these groups, and it's not a conspiracy, it's just that we have a heritage of learning. We have a heritage of learning. And this is not to knock my other heritage. My Irish heritage, 400 years ago, was still trying to learn how to dig up potatoes. 3,000 years now, we've been studying and learning, and it's just a heritage. So, and if I use that for the good, if I use my knowledge and my, my discernment to be uh, good in this world, then Hashem's gonna show me the right way and show me the right things to say and show me the right way to uh, do my activism, which is a huge part of my life. It's His plan, and, I, and that's what I've learned from all these guys. It's just, it's His plan. Have a Shabbat in my life. Make sure it's reckoned. Make sure that I celebrate that. He's got it. He's got this, and and I don't do. I don't do my mitzvahs so that I'll get anything. I, I honestly, I'll be honest. I feel sometimes that when I do things, I just get a little wink from Hashem. I got you. I got you. Just go be of service. I got you. In the world of the internet, there's lots of things to be able to learn online and people can educate themselves online, especially young teenagers who are impressionable. For young people who are looking for answers online, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes going through a bit of an identity crisis, so they they might be going to the wrong places right. in terms of some inspiration or some sense of identity and purpose. Mm -hmm. How? What advice would you give to young teens, adults who are looking for something, you know, just how to make sure they're searching in the right places? Yeah, no, it... it if you're online and you're searching and, and you're noticing that everywhere you're going is someone talking bad about others to make you feel good, then you're going down the wrong. If you're starting, if you want to find your identity, find where you're listening to people that are talking about how you make you better. Just make yourself better. Have, you know, if you're gravitated towards and the websites and the rabbit holes you're going down are always at the end, you're blaming them then you're not you're not in the right spot because it's it's never about other, you know it's never about what others are doing it's about what you're doing start go to find people that are mentors in your life it's not other people's faults that you feel this way it's never other people's faults so when people feel spiritually sick how do you how do you suggest they start to heal themselves well prayer prayer meditation is um, you know I take about an hour and a half every day after I do my tefillin and I do my prayers, my blessings, um, because I, I'm horrible at Hebrew. I'm horrible at English, let alone Hebrew. So uh, I speak everything in English. But after I do that, I do it about an hour and a half God walk every day. And I don't do that because I'm so spiritual. I do that because I know that I'm broken and I, you know, and I need to get right. And I keep, I say these words to myself all day long, especially in my prayers. I say the word stay, S-T-A-Y, 
Stop thinking about yourself. All right, Hashem, what would you have me do? How, how can I be of service? How can I be of maximum service today to you and to, you know, I deal a lot with uh, really sick people sometimes in, in the drug and alcohol world. So how can I be of service to them today? And then never hide my past. You know, if you make mistakes, be okay with, be the greatest thing we get to do with each other is be like, oh, I did that too. Oh my God, I felt so stupid. Oh my God, do you, you know, the, do you ever have that time when you're having that conversation and you're feeling really bad about something and your friend says, oh my God, I did that too. And you go, oh, oh my God. Yeah, okay, we're okay. That's what we're here to do is to have those conversations with one another so you don't feel so isolated, you know, because everyone makes these mistakes and it's okay for us to say to each other, I made that mistake too. If you like this conversation and you like having meaningful conversations, please like and subscribe.